Hello and welcome once again to Crazy Comics and Stories. It's me, your charming and delightful old Uncle Rap Bastard. And at the other end of the series of tubes and wires that we call the Internet is Joe, Crazy Writer. How you doing today, Joe? I think we're in trouble. Oh, God, what did I do now? Well, it's it's not you or I per se. I don't know, Joe. You... I ordered three new shirts for the cleaner. Yeah, well, that might have something to do with it because, as you know, we're trying to clean up this here podcast. Oh, we are? Because for the longest time, we've had an explicit label, which I've been annoyed with. I mean, yeah, it's great to let off a few Effenheimers now and then. But really, we were we worked hard not to have it because we kind of wanted to make it enjoyable for all. But I, I inquired on a few channels discreetly about how we could try to get off the explicit label. And I got here in my hands from the Office of Film and Literature Classification, the code for language and what the words that we need to say, not say, in order to uh, get an unrestricted classification. So this is like the seven words you can't say on television. Although oh, a lot better. of the words that you used to not be able to say on television, you can say on television. Yeah, you can say, you know, fart now. Uh, you can say this, turd now. This is, this I is heard the turd words, on a TV PG show. Regardless, these are the words that the Office of Film and Literature Classification suggest that we do not use... Uh, they don't want any sexually suggestive combination of words that don't appear on the list. Uh, so when you say ball bearing or cocktail, you just can't go, hey, cocktail. How about Kazoo it, Parade? It should be borne in mind that, there, there you go, and, and the context can be rendered even innocuous words offensive. So the following words and the derivatives you and I will not be able to use on the podcast and anymore. And I want to remind people, we always remind people, do not, and I repeat, do not do Google Lemon Party. Hang on a second. Oh, sweet Jesus. My fault. Okay. Is that Anyways, on there? I... Nope. Oh. It's on it's on my uh, my my one of my windows I opened by accident. Okay. The following words and the derivatives are not acceptable and will not be used here by Solitaire Rose Production in any form. Arse. Blowjob. Beaver, uh, 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 the C word. I'm not even going to use Wait, it. I, mean, I can't talk about Winona's big brown beaver anymore. Nope, nope. And you cannot talk about B C anymore. Uh, cock, cum, dick. So you're going to cancel cancel your 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 interviews with anybody named Richard. So I can't talk about when I was uh, when I, when I was summa cum laude. Nope. Fart, frig, fuck, Hooters. Horny hornbag, jerk off, lezo, muff, moist, norks, nunga, nympho, piss, prick, pubes, pussy, root, screw, shit, slut, slew, tits, titteries, turds, twat, or wank. Those are the following words they don't. For us to get a non explicit label, we have to not say these words anymore on this here podcast. Hmm. Is it worth it? Well, here's what I think. I don't fuck it. <sighs> well, I tried. We've got comic news, Joe. We do? Yes. Uh, Amazing Spider-Man number 800 came out. Oh, I wonder if that's in my... That must be in my box day coming up. Uh, drawn by Stuart Immonen. Immonen? Immonen? Immonen. Hang on. Let me look. Yeah, that's on the list, too. Anyways. So, uh, you should enjoy that comic. You should uh, give it a hug when it shows up, because that is his last monthly comic ever. Oh, really? Yes. Now, is he joining, joining you in retirement? Well, he has said he is retired from monthly comics. Some people oh. are saying that, oh, he's retired from comics. No, he said he's retired from monthly comics. He's uh, done 20 years of monthly comics. He wants to explore other things. It doesn't mean he might not come back for a miniseries or a graphic novel or something special, but he says he is done drawing monthly comics. And as I thought about it, 20 years at one job, that's a long time. 
you're telling me I'm looking to hit seven years in seven years. I'll have 20 years at TSA. And if I'm lucky, I'll be able to retire. And, you know, we think of comics as, oh, wow, they get to be in comics as long as they want. Well, there are two things. One, 20 years of sitting at a board chasing deadlines. That's a long time. And second, 20 years in comics, there are other people who have not been able to put together 20 years in comics. There are other people who, you know, after a while, they're not able to get work. You know, they, they've they been doing books for so long that they just, you know, they're freelance, so they're asking around, is there any jobs out there, and things dry up. So, in one way, it might be better to leave while you're still, you know, it's like the Seinfeld thing. Leave while the audience still likes you. But I was thinking about, you know, he's been in comics 20 years. The thing that I first remember him on was Superman. And the thing where I first became a huge fan of his was Next Wave. After Next Wave, it's like, okay, I'm buying anything he does. <laughs> yeah. And uh, one of the books that we'll be reviewing later was drawn by him. Well, that I'll be reviewing later was actually drawn by him. So uh, there's that. Mm -hmm. Uh, also, in comic news, the Gepi Museum closed over the weekend, and everything in it was given to the Smithsonian. Which is kudos to uh, uh, Gepi for doing that. That's amazing. I mean, he probably could have made a few billion dollars selling the stuff he has. Now, hopefully, the Library of Congress doesn't lose it like they've been wont to do. And uh, I remember... Wasn't he trying to put back together the uh, Mile High collection? Maybe. I, I know one of my great regrets is, you know, A, I'll never get to the museum. But B, when I was on the road, and, and again, you can go back. This was when I was in D.C., and I, I think we were podcasting then because uh, I, I ended up, it was one of my freaking, we had all gone to a baseball game at the uh, uh Oh, what do they call it? The Orioles Candlestick Park there. Beautiful area. Uh, basically a, a, an old train uh, warehouse that they reorganized into shops. And I don't know if there were condos there. And anyways, I was talking with people I hadn't seen. And then I turned around and it dawned on me. Holy shit, that's Gepi's Museum. I've been standing in front of it for an hour. <laughs> I ran over to it. And nope, it closed at six o'clock on game days. And, uh, you know, that was one of the things they talked about. They didn't actually have enough people going through it. And I kept thinking, well, maybe if you didn't close on game day, I mean, maybe you had to. But, you know, I, I wanted to just run through it. I forgot an hour till the game started. I had we all had, you know, reserved seats so I could catch up with everybody. But nope, they closed at six o'clock. That was the closest I got. I was next to Nirvana. <sighs> It's like oh, when well. uh, Homer Simpson almost saw Mr. T at the mall. <sighs> or like when Sheldon went all that way just to go see Will Wheaton to find out when he finally got to the con that he had to cancel his appearance. He made a mortal enemy that day. But like Will says, it's not a full-time job. <laughs> well, and uh, we had people cancel at our convention. I never called them a mortal en enemy. Even though uh, one of them screwed, well, a couple of them screwed us over pretty, pretty hard. Names, names. We need names. John Romita Jr. Oh, canceled. He actually canceled day of, and we had kind of shot our load with him. He was the one big name we we put, you know, because he, you know, wanted the first class, uh, first class plane and. You know, all these special extras and everything. And then day of, he canceled because uh, I think his wife got sick or something. Oh. And it was, well, who do you, who else do you have? Well, there's Dan Jurgens. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty much it. They were like a one wad pony. They, uh, I do recall meeting him at Greenberg's aborted two-day con. You know, I mean, he had Jim Lee, he had Stan Lee, he had all sorts of people, including guys like Joe Lindsner before they were hot. No, no, Jim Lee. Lee's. Jim Lee. Yeah, but Jim and Jay, Stan. Didn't he have Jay Lee no. as well? Jay Lee was at one of the hotel, uh, what was across from the Thunderbird? 
Oh, I don't remember anymore. Now. It was just a just a generic hotel. Okay. Once a month, Greenberg would have a, sh oh, a okay. show that was just in a hotel room, and he had Jay Lee there, and that that's when Butch uh, was sort of befriended him because Jay just kind of showed up and like there was nobody from Greenberg to tell him what to do. So we just kind of hung out with him, and this was before he started his run on, on Namer. So I got a really, really cool name for sketch. And we just kind of hung with them. And we told, you know, we pimped up Archon, but uh, I don't know if they were never able to hook up to, to get to it. There was a lot of that going on in the early early years of the con where they would, like, pimp up a guest or, or uh, like, when they had Peter David there, they were hoping to get a rub off him by at least mentioning he came to the show in, in his uh, column in Comic Buyer's Guide. But he was so enthralled with his... Uh, fight with Todd McFarlane that ended up being a squash match. You know, basically you never, never fight a writer in a, you know, verbal match. It's well, just... and Peter David showed up with, you know, stuff. You know, he had, oh, yeah, he took he it serious research. He was ready to go. And Todd just kind of showed up to be a clown. Yeah. Showed up in boxing tights. We should probably uh, explain. Uh, uh, it was a debate. It was going to be a debate between Peter David. A master debate. At, and uh, Todd McFarlane. And Todd McFarlane kept changing what it was about. Because it was supposed to be, you know, do our writers needed in comics. And then Todd McFarlane kept changing it to, is Image doing the right thing? And Peter David said, no, you wanted to talk about if writers are needed in comics. <laughs> <sighs> and that so was that all didn't pan out. YouTube. I know they had uh, Jim Valentino there once. And uh, they were hoping that he might schmooze to get the other image guys there. And this is before they, you know, they were big wigs, but they weren't, uh, you know, like Jim Lee, almost unattainable. And same thing with Todd. Yeah, he wasn't busy running his uh, toy empire. Uh, I actually ran into Jim at a different con and, and talked to him. Yeah, we met at the MCBA con. He didn't remember it. I said, yeah, you left a nice note for uh, Pat McDonough on the tablecloth. Nope. Didn't remember a thing. So, and I just kind of changed the subject. I was like, you can always, you know, beat a, ha a hammer so many times, you know, before you realize, you know, I better put a nail in front of it because he just had no idea what I was talking about. Well, and, and it, you know, it might have been just that. did he do in the 90s? Yeah. Well, you just wonder if, you know, again, it's, it's one of those things where it's like he left an awesome impression on everybody, but we didn't make a decent impression on him. So, Again, these were just hopes and dreams of the of the con guys, and now it's almost the other way around. They're like, yeah, we're going to invite who we, you know, they invite a lot of people, but not everybody wants to come. You know, I, I have a, a constant running dialogue going with, well, we asked this person, well, they don't travel anymore. They, well, they only do cons in their area. Well, they don't, well, they, you know, one guy, they they kept asking, you know, well, what's there to do in Minnesota? Well, we got this, we got this, we got the mall, we got uh, you got nothing. I'm not coming. So, geez, thanks. So, who knows? Maybe we'll get uh, Eminem now that he's uh, he's not tied down to do a monthly book. Because that's also something too. I'm, I'm you know aware of is a lot of these guys, especially uh, they're in in uh, con season now. Although con season is pretty much year round, but you know they'll go to the big ones, especially San Diego. Although there are a lot of guys that don't go because it's almost too big. But uh, like. Eric Larson talks about the Savage Dragon guy. He says, you know, when I'm at a con, that means I'm away from doing my book. And, you know, it's no fun to sit in a hotel room. I'm paraphrasing. Uh, you know, doing your book while everybody's out partying. So when he decides to do a con, he's got to decide, you know, what comes first, the book or the convention? You know, that's why Neil Gaiman asked 50, 60 grand to do a speaking engagement because, yeah, that's the money he figures he'd be losing because he's not sitting wherever he's sitting writing. So, and there's so many conventions. Even, even uh, you know, Pat and I were talking about, and I mentioned it last time, the uh, upcoming Minnesota Fan Fusion in August. And all the guests that are going there that were at one time at our show, including Jay Lee, including Frank Cho, Peter David. Uh, there's a couple of guys, you know, Dan Jurgens is going to be there, rightfully so. Uh, but I'm pretty sure these are paying gigs, Yep. you know, so they're getting paid. Uh, I found out one of my personal uh, uh, kitty heroes is going to be there, Lee Majors. 
to curse the six million dollar man. Uh, no, and he's Ash's father. Was that got canceled? But to me, no, he's, he's always Ash's father. He's still the six million dollar man. Of course, now probably a little bit more. But I mean, I'm like, okay, there are not many people I would pay to stand in line to pay to get a picture to pay to get a signature. He's one of them. And I didn't realize that until I saw he was there because I'm like, dude, you don't realize how I mean, the six million dollar man was the superhero show. And I'm doing air quotes in the 70s. I mean, if you weren't a kid running around a neighborhood going nah, 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 and doing that slow motion run, you just you just weren't cool. Although when more came on, nah, 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 that was pretty cool. So there is somebody that I may I may I'm going to have to wait and look online, and see, because I don't know if he'll have. Uh, an extra appearance, I imagine he would, but uh, you know. And of course, the the danger with all these guys is you never know they might cancel because they get a paying gig. Uh, they got to do that, you know. Obviously, him and uh, Bruce Campbell are free, so if Bruce Campbell shows up. <laughs> that would be sweet. Uh, one other thing I want to point out: I don't go through all the numbers anymore because Joe always rolls his eyes when I do. But I would like to point out that all... Uh oh uh oh hang on. Damn it, my eyes just fell out. Hang on. Okay, keep going. All of the Saga trades are in the top 100. What happened to Walking Dead? Walking Dead has kind of cooled a little bit. But Saga... Well, also can't. it probably sells a lot more in bookstores and everything. But Saga... Um, what, I think number eight... Trade paperback number eight and number one were both in the top 20. So I think that's your new Walking Dead, where if you're a shop, that's a license to print money. Same with Paper Girls, which is also by Brian K. Vaughn. Um, volume one has been in the top 20 every time I looked. So uh, it used to be if Neil, Neil Gaiman did something, it was always going to be in the top 10, top 20. Mm -hmm. Brian K. Vaughn is that person right now. So there's eight books. I know I've got the first one. I have yet to read it, but but uh, it, it's on the read list. And Paper Girls, I know I've uh, we reviewed I the actually, first book. I did, and I actually had a couple runs on eBay. I think I still do have one of the runs on eBay. So if you, if you're looking for it and you you still are, uh, I just I'll take a quick peek here and see if uh, Paper Girls. I can spell paper. Yep, I got Paper Girls 1 through 10. And, of course, if, you, if you're interested, run over to the Ebays and pick it up. Otherwise, I think I'll probably do like I was doing. Pretty much, I, I, I pick up a good image run if I'm interested. And if I really like it, I'll, I'll sell the first six or whatever, the if it's four or five or whatever, and then just pick them up in paperbacks. And sometimes, in the case of, like, Saga, they've got two deluxe hardcovers, but it only goes, I think, up to issue 36. And the paperbacks, eight volumes, they go up to like uh, 48, I think. Yeah. So, and I don't want to wait. Like I said, I've got that first one. I know once I start, I'm just going to go for it. <sighs> I'm going to be. I, I love having things to read. I'm going to be interested to see how well the uh, Runaways Omnibus does now that Brian K. Vaughn can pretty much, you know, sell every month. I wonder if it's going to sell more than your average uh, Marvel hardcover omnibus because, you know, you've got the TV show on Hulu. It's Brian K. Vaughn. And while they've brought the characters back, it says eh, not, uh, it's not setting the world on fire. I'm not sure. I don't see a large market for omnibus. And even at the con, there weren't a lot of people carrying them. So I because wonder I if... Uh, <laughs> no, they just weren't carrying them. Because you know if I had seen them, I'd, I'd text you and say, hey, these are here. Which ones you want me to pick up? So I'm just wondering if, if maybe as a retailer, they, uh, they're they doing one of two things. They're either just not ordering them because there's no sell-through in them. They might be pre-ordering them, uh, but they're just not something you put on the shelf. Especially not, well, you know, you and I order through discount comic book service. And, uh, you know, they're always being blown out online on Amazon. But they also have the phenomena of... If you leave it sealed and it goes out of print, they go up in value like crazy. So it's it's a it's an interesting conundrum. You know, I, I don't think the omnibus bar omnibus market is as big as it should be. 
But on the other hand, if they have lots of trades on Runaway and they're they're available and ready for a retailer to order, that probably would be a more a more uh, positive revenue stream. I know I would always like to have them. You know, I always had the the big run of the DC archives and the Marvel Masterworks. You know, not only do they look cool, but somebody comes in and goes, "Hey," or even the EC sets that you ended up buying. You know, I only bought you two EC see, sets from you. You don't see a lot of those in stores. No. I'm mean, not talking. I mean, omnibus. Back to the omnibus. Even that adamantium collection I tried to assassinate you with. You don't see them. I mean, they're there, but I think it's a very small market that's willing to drop two hundred bucks to buy a huge collection like that. Well, your average omnibus, according to the sales stuff on uh, ICV2, sells around a thousand copies, which is really nothing in. Uh, in the you know you figure how many well i guess i was gonna say hundreds of thousands but really that a lot not a lot of comics sell over a hundred thousand no. copies and you won't see them at uh barnes and noble you know unless they're being blown out somewhere i've never seen an omnibus there i've seen you know other trades that they call omnibuy like dark horse and idw yeah. had their their omnibuy versions there but you know there's a, you know, those are those are pale imitations. We're talking about the foundation of your house type omnibus, like you know, R value tornado shelter building type. You know, you can kill small mammals and large elephants. You may stun them type omnibus. Come to think of it, I got to replace my bookshelf. The first one's almost bent over because of the omnibus. <laughs> they do do that. They're uh, they they uh, they gather their weight pretty quickly. Yeah. Hmm. Any news on on comics that you've been reading about that you found interesting this week, Joe? Not really. I've been kind of getting back into the work groove, you know, so I don't have the... Uh, it has been kind of interesting because other than the week of... I haven't even changed my calendar yet. I think I'm an A. But the week of work in the Comic-Con, and then, of course, we went up north, and that was kind of blissful because you're kind of away from everything, including Facebook. And... You know, now I'm back just trying to get into the groove. <sighs> so, Corey had so you're getting groovy. excellent idea. He said, how about we do an all-review episode? And I said, oh, that means I got to read comics. And then I said, hey, that means I get to read comics. <laughs> so what are you, What what is first on your list, Joe? First on my list is a miniseries called Pencilhead. From a creator called Ted McGeever, uh, uh, published yes. two house, 2016. I don't think a trade's available, but it didn't. It didn't exactly light the world on fire. Uh, Ted is a uh, American comic author artist. Uh, started in '87. He's done uh, for Vortex Comics to Transit. Uh, did a series called Eddie Current which was a 12-hour book centering on an escape from an asylum. Uh, he's known for doing uh, plastic forks for Epic, uh, Metropol, and did The Extremist for Vertigo, a uh, four-parter written by Pete Milligan. And he's got a very unique style. In this case, Pencilhead deals with a mostly true five-issue series about the whacked-out world of comic books. So if you're if you're all interested, you know, we we're talking laughing about that earlier. And he talks a lot about that in here. Mostly, you know, how he's sitting at the desk alone in the room drawing. And if he doesn't like what he draws, and now he starts over. And of course, the series goes on. It's kind of thinly veiled. So hopefully you'll recognize the different things, such as like when they run into uh, Crank Filler and he starts going on and on about just different things about they were driving me to the station when let's, one of the cops asked me, you're the guy who created Skin Smitty? And I said, hell yes. And they said, they're big fans and then asked for an autograph. Shook my hand, let me go. They offered me a ride, but I said, no, thanks. And just uh, just a strange encounter with him after they left the office. It uh, talks about how Ted was kind of screwed around by different editors. It's like they took his art and they, well, sound balloon, sell. So we put a lot of sound effects in here. We had this guy do it for you. 
And how he comes in one day, the new editor in chief, ah, we got no work for you. Bye. Uh, if you're at all interested, first of all, you're a, t- a fan of Ted, you got to pick this up. It's it's black and white. It's his art style. It's fun to read. It's kind of insightful at just how shitty the comic industry is. And of course, when he finally runs into Zach Gerby, Corey, do you know who Zach Gerby is? I think he's a guy who said uh, he wrote Commando, I think, yeah, or drew it. Don't get into comics, kid. They'll break your heart. Yep, but he, Ted got a chance. He talks about meeting him right after he found uh, a first issue that was missing of Commando. And then he he runs into, uh, holy moly, it's Zach Kirby. And Zach asks, where can I get one of those delicious looking hot dogs you got there? And he points, he goes, thanks, youngster. And he stops, uh, Mr. Kirby, yes, my boy, I was wondering. And see if Corey knows the answer. Corey? When Ted asked Zach, is there anything you don't like to draw? What did he say? I don't know, because I have not read this book yet, but I'm guessing horses. Close. Cows and skateboards. Ah. See you around, kiddo. (laughs) (laughs) So, a fun issue. Uh, You might be able to find it. Like I said, I don't think the... uh, I thought the graphic novel was solicited, but I don't know for sure. But uh, if you have, if you're all a fan of Ted's, you want to try something different, or you just want to find out a mostly true uh, stuff about the whacked out world of comic books, this is your issue, Corey. Um, I read an old series that might as well have been a mini series because it only lasted five issues. That's right, Joe. I read the original Shanna the She Devil. Oh, well, wait a minute. How old was that? 1973. Ooh. Lasted five issues. First issue was written by uh, Carolyn Suling and Steve Gerber. And Joe, you're probably thinking, I know that last name of the woman who wrote it. No, I was just wondering if uh, uh, Diablo was part of this or was that later on? That was later on. But okay. At Necra, she fought Necra in one of her issues. But uh, it, Carol Suling was Phil Suling's wife. Oh, interesting. And Gerber helped with the first issue, and then she wrote the next few, and then uh, Gerber wrote the last issue. And it was a, it was different from a lot of the you know jungle action type comics of the time. In that, she was a animal rights activist. And she patrolled Africa fighting uh, poachers and smugglers until the sales weren't doing well. So then she started fighting some superheroes, supervillains. Um, drawn by George Tuska. Be able to tell it was George Tuska. It was drawn very much like a, what they call a good girl comic. Which, um, the, the way, Joe, you know how those books got called good girl comics, right? Wow. That's some good girl art. I know the bad girl side of it. I never yeah. caught the good girl. Good girl. It was called good girl art because, wow, that guy draws a good girl art. Ah, good girls. And um, I had never read them before. I want, I like reading those 70s, five, you know, short run series because it was very clear that trying for stuff that just didn't work. And it was also incredibly clear that there was a very heavy editorial hand on the scripting because it read like every other, you know, kind of midline Marvel book of the 70s. Um, In reading it, you would not think that it's the same character that is around now because, you know, in the, what, in the late 70s, they hooked her up with Kazar the Savage um, and when Frank Cho got her, hooked her up with, like, Double D chest. Yeah. But for mid-70s uh, Jungle Books, this was probably one of the least offensive. Although it was, <laughs> all the natives have to be saved by the white people. Mm. Which is why when um, Don McGregor took over Black Panther, he, he, you know, it was set in Africa, he didn't want any white people. Why? Because every Jungle Book is white people saving the natives. 
And I don't want to write that. That's racist. So this was very much um, white girl saving the natives. And there was a, her best pal was an Australian um, park ranger who she kept in the friend zone by literally saying things like, I don't have time for romance. I must save these elephants. Uh, but it was one of those things where, you know, I'd never read it. I, on a review scale, on the buy, borrow, or ignore, unless you're really interested, it's an ignore. If you're really interested, try to find some beat-up copies, because that's what I did. But it's aggressively mediocre. And um, other than the fact that she had a very interesting take on things... Uh, and it was very 70s ecological. Um, not a lot there. Joe? Uh, the the one, next one I picked up was a book that I'd have in my collection. Matter of fact, all the stuff, uh, with the exception of two that I'll be reviewing, were collections that I just had sitting around. I tend to pick up miniseries, wait till I have them all, and just sit up, read them in a, in a bunch. Or in a case of like uh, uh, mini series or just a regular series, like we talked about, Paper Girls. I just want to read. I'll try reading one and see if it really catches me. But oftentimes it takes a few issues for me to actually warm up to it. And that was definitely the case in this one, Superman Unchained, starting in 2003, and what did it was nine issues, I think it was. Uh, and it's got Scott Snyder writing it, Jim Lee drawing it. And occasionally some help with uh, Dustin Nigan. When the first issue came out, they had oodles of variants based on the. It was the 75th anniversary of suit. They had the 30s cover, Golden Age cover, Silver Age cover, all done by different people. Some of these go for silly, silly money. The the 1930s cover, uh, I see 160 bucks if you can find it. The the Golden Age cover, 75, and those must have been the scarce ones. By the time you get down to uh, the the new fifty two cover, which is the one I got, uh, it's only six bucks. You know, so again, watch your variants because it can go up, it can go down. There's second prints, at least for the first issue. The story basically, and I, I'm reading this right off Atomic Avenue. Thirteen satellites fall from the sky one day, and a logical suspect is Lex Luthor, even though he's locked up in prison. But a stranger question remains: If Superman didn't stop the last satellite from falling, who did? It's a mystery hidden even when Superman can't see it. Can the Man of Steel drag a decades-old secret into the light? Well, the, the answer is yes. Otherwise, you know, it'd be like one issue over. <laughs> uh, this is New 52 Superman. Again, Jim Lee, Art, I was willing to give it a shot. Story's okay. Uh, again, Scott Snyder wrote it. It's a little bit, you know, I don't know. Maybe it's too new... 52-ish, you know, I mean, Superman's kind of the, the power that everybody's worried about. Lex Luthor does a pretty good role. You can't tell if he's a villain, if he's whatever. Of course, when you finally do get to the mystery, which I don't really want to reveal because, you know, I go out and read it for yourself. Uh, there were a couple things in there. They did a couple of the classic comic book things that I absolutely hate, hate, hate. And, of course, it, it deals with, uh, oh, what the hell's Lois Lane's dad's name, the military guy. Oh, Apparently yeah. he he just works on his own. You know he he declares war on Superman, declares war on the the uh, Arctic. He's using super high tech stuff. He's he's almost like he's answerable to no one, and that is such a cliche. Uh, I'd be very surprised in the modern world if you found a general anywhere that could just go and declare war on something without properly using the chain of command. And really, that's all it takes is a few lines that say, uh, you know, this has been authorized by the president, Superman. You need to stand down. Or, you know, in this case, unless I missed it, I didn't see that line anywhere. So for me, I'm like, oh, great. This guy's going after the most powerful person on the planet. Or is he? Remember, something pushed away that 13th satellite. And, you know, on the, on the plus side, though, the other parts of the DC universe are there. Batman, Wonder Woman, the other guys. So, you know, when Superman is doing these world-shattering things, he's not acting alone, at least not all the time. Uh, there's a couple oh-my-God moments that only comics can deliver, like, you know, when it all seems like 
Hope is is gone. The next panel, bam. Nope. Hope's back. Uh, again, I'm, I'm trying to be a little cryptic because on on the the uh, buy, borrow, or ignore. I would definitely put this under a borrow. Uh, again, the story was okay. It ends kind of and you're like, wait a minute. There's a lot of ramifications here and again i don't know if this was just a standalone i kind of expect with scott snyder and jim lee it would be or if it was one that uh should have been okay here's you know we just had this major thing these are some of the things that need to be covered for it uh but again there's a lot of a lot of comics out there there's uh two books a hardcover and a regular so if, if it sounds like it's up your alley, Scott Snyder, Jim Lee, Superman, new DC 52, uh, definitely check it out. I mean, I don't regret reading it. Uh, I don't think I'll ever reread it, but it was definitely worth a read. Corey? Joe, did you know that Tag and Bink are dead? Again? I, I, I didn't even know they were sick. Back uh, when Dark Horse had the Star Wars license, they did a short story of two kind of uh, dopey characters who interacted in and around Star Wars, the, the, A New Hope, um, to explain how the stormtrooper bonked his head and things like that. And it was popular enough that they've done another one, and then they did a third one, and then they've all been collected in a book. Uh, well, it, 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 oversized comic. And Marvel just reprinted it. And I had not read it since the original Dark Horse uh, book came out. And if you are a Star Wars fan with a sense of humor, you have got to buy this book. The art is fun, but the story is just a blast. It pokes fun at Star Wars. It has these characters weaving in and out of the story so that a lot of the things that just were a little goofy in the story actually make sense now. There's a reason why. Boba Fett screamed like a little girl in his in Return of the Jedi. Uh, there's a reason why one of the uh, the the Tie Fighters with Darth Vader lost control and went spinning off, wrecking his ship, and stuff like that. And it's just so much fun. And, and I will say, if it's not something to give to a hardcore, take it way too serious fan. Because I gave it to a couple that I thought would actually enjoy it, and that, that, I didn't like it at all. Well, and I'm like, you have to be like, able... you're taking it way too serious here, dude. Yes. That's the problem with a lot of people. It's, nah, you're, you're taking this too serious. It needs to be fun. And that's what I liked about it. It was just fun. It was funny. It was clever. Um, it wove in and out of uh, all the Star Wars stories. And, and Joe, I'm... And you'll never watch Star Wars again the same. I'm going to make a literary reference. Uh -oh. It reminded me a lot of the Tom Stoppard play, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are Dead, which um, tells everything that happens off stage to the characters Rosencrantz and Guildenstern from Hamlet. And this is the same sort of thing where it's, okay, we're going to have two minor characters who they have some interaction with the main characters, but really, it's all about them and their world interacting with with the plot. Um, it's only seven ninety nine, and it's you know it's a uh, you know it's not a trade paperback. Really, it's just kind of a big thick comic, but it's actually sold as a trade paperback, according to Diamond. So it's still in print. Um, on the buy, borrow, or ignore, if you're a Star Wars fan with a sense of humor, this is a heavy, heavy buy. Joe? The next one, I'm going to have a tough time reviewing because I want you to go read this book. And I'm not, I don't really want to tell you a lot about it because it was so much fun going into it, not knowing what was going on. Essentially, the only thing I remember is you wake up uh, naked in a field and you go from there. Or I should say he's underwear clad, but he's in, he doesn't remember a thing. Uh, I will tell you, though, if, 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 if you want to know more about it, I mean, uh, the first thing that happens is he picks up a phone and it says, after figuring out the passcode, the message just says, run. Now, there's only four issues to this. It's uh, 
called The Field. I'm sorry, at no, The Field from Image 2014. Four issues. There's a book as well. Ed Brisson writes it. Simon Roy is the artist. Uh, do you need to know more, Corey? Well, how about this? An ex-Bible salesman on a meth-induced murder spree. How about if I if I add a seedy biker gang on a revenge mission? How about a group of cosplayers out to save the world? What more do you need to know? How's the art? Awesome. It, it, there's not a single time I had to stop and go, wait, what happened? What happened with the action? Who's who? Everybody's very recognizable. Uh, and I just, I had a blast with this. I was kind of curious as to... How are they going to do this in four issues? And they did. And that's all you need. And, you know, you, we always laughed about done in one. Well, this one's done in four. Uh, they, they're not extremely collectible, so you should be able to pick them up. But because of 2014, you might have to dig a little. Or just go buy the uh, graphic novel. It's a, it's a you know, $15 book. Probably find it for less if you poke around somewhere. But again, from image to field. That's all I'm going to say about that, Corey. I have read the first two issues of the new Avengers book by Jason Aaron and Ed and? McGinnis. Ooh. Now, one of the problems I usually have with Ed McGinnis over the last few years is he's gotten more and more cartoony, which is good on some books, but on other books, it's uh, you know, no, we we could we don't want the Avengers to look really cartoony. Ed McGinnis has toned down the cartoonish style and turned it up on the uh, Kirby meter, in my estimation, in that everything feels big. Everything is, uh, this is a big story. The last Celestial is coming to Earth, and the Avengers have been reformed to stop him. And the first two issues have won me over. This is... Uh, the Avengers should be Marvel's central book, and this felt like a big deal. It felt like important things were happening. It felt like things were in peril. And it also made me really like the new Ghost Rider. You know, the one who uh, has a car instead of a motorcycle. And you understand why he's part of the story now. But this was just a fun, well-done big screen superhero book and Ed McGinnis's art is better than it's been I would say since uh, he did uh, Superman Batman over at DC I could not have enjoyed it more the first two issues are out on the buy borrow or ignore again this is a buy this is a very heavy buy Joe what do you think could get me up on my day off before 9 a.m. Pie. nope gets me up well everything like that gets you up no. i mean I, I honestly expect in the reboot of american pie you're going to be the pie fucker <laughs> there's that explicit tag yeah yeah we're gonna drag that sucker to the ground we are no longer sorry Corey. gonna be the clean show i got up 9:05 a.m this morning and saw deadpool 2 this is a non-spoiler review, and it's going to be short. Quite simply, if you liked Deadpool, what are you waiting for? Go see it. If you didn't like it, don't bother. It's just that simple. There's nothing in Deadpool 2 that's going to make you suddenly say, oh, you know what, this foul mouth, violent, ugly, vi you know, uh, sexually... Uh, loose, uh, cancer-ridden idiot is going to change my mind and suddenly be the Academy Award winner he deserves to be. But uh, if if you if you if you laughed yourself silly, you should go see this because I laughed myself silly. Uh, I got up with a, a couple of buddies of mine. We went out to the Marcus Oakdale Theater. They their first show start at 9 a.m. now. And it was the bistro, which was amazing because they, you know, the bistro is you go in, you sit down, and they have somebody uh, take care of you. If you want candy pop, if a buddy of mine, he wanted a grilled cheese, uh, another guy, a cheap bastard, just wanted water. And, and I ordered myself a plate of donuts 
that if you recall a long time ago, I ordered and bitched about because it didn't taste like donuts. They had fried them right after cheese curds. So I had donut cheese, cheese curds and, uh, no, strike that reverse it. Cheese curd tasting donuts that, that taste don't go together. Uh, but oh my gosh, it was just amazing. It was fun. Uh, what was neat is it was only like four of us in the theater, me, my two friends, and then a, a poor lady up front who probably thought these dumbasses are never going to shut up. And we did. You know, we, we made me make rude, tasteless comments during the reviews. But uh, uh, there are uh, early after credit scenes uh, once they're over with and you'll know what they are. You don't have to hang all the way to the end unless you want to hear the funkiest theme song that's ever been given a villain. And that's all I'm going to say because I don't want it spoiled. I don't want Deadpool come through and, and kill me for ruining it for the th millions and millions of listeners we have here. But uh, definitely go see it. Corey? Uh, next book I am reviewing is Vader. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Did you see Deadpool? Not yet. Stop this air podcast. Go see it. We'll finish the reviews later. No, nah, I'm going to see it uh, Sunday, m Sunday morning. So we can talk about it next week. Yes. Spoilers. Spoiler alert. And we can also have talk about week. Solo next week because I'm going to go see that too. You have one week to see both these movies. Well, actually two from the time we were recording. So no excuses. Anyways, your next review. Uh, I read Vader Down, which was the first crossover in the Marvel Star Wars comics. And uh, it's written by Jason Aaron kind of a theme this week, drawn by Mike Diodato. And one of the things that I noticed as I'm reading these Star Wars comics and getting caught up on them is this was not done in a traditional panel-by-panel panel way. The panels were all horizontal across the page, so there were like four horizontal panels to a page rather than you know, a panel on one side, a panel on the other, et cetera, et cetera, or an arrangement of panels. These were like, you know, just widescreen panels. And Mike Diodato used to be uh, kind of a booby and ass, hot, hot. And ass artist. Hot, hot, hot. That was back when he had a studio. And rumor was that he was just kind of directing the studio down in, uh, I think he's Brazilian. I know he's from South America, but he wasn't really doing much of the art. He would maybe do layouts, and his uh, assistants would do all the the actual drawing. But uh, now, from what I hear, he's the one doing the art. It's much more detailed. It's much more realistic. Um, my problem with this story was it started big. Um, Darth Vader has crashed on a planet. The uh, It's between Star Wars and Empire. So Vader has crashed on a planet. The Rebellion knows where he is. They're going to throw everything they can to try and either capture or kill him. So it's Vader himself versus the Rebellion. And when it's that, it's very cool. But about halfway through the story, it, that just kind of fades away. And it becomes um, little side stories. And then at the end, Vader just kind of leaves. Well, he does kind of smush the rebellion. I mean, I don't yeah. mean to spoil it, but... But we really didn't get... It really didn't feel like an ending. It felt more like, oh, and Vader left the end. I thought the story started strong, but faded as it went along. To the point where we're getting um, Han Solo and Chewbacca versus Dr. Afra in, a, in a, what, a, a valley of some kind that takes an entire issue. And all I could think is, no, I, this is not what I want to see. I want to see Darth Vader kicking ass, and I want to see the Rebellion coming up with plans to, to, to get back at him. But we never really got that beyond the first half of the story. So I, I ended up being disappointed. I have not read the entire Darth Vader series that uh, came out. I do have the omnibus of it, so I'll be doing that. But uh, on this one, it's a borrow. Because I felt like they lost the story thread about halfway through. Joe? I have one question for you. Is Jim Starlin through at Marvel? 
he says he is not going to be working at Marvel after he has completed the current um, Infinity Trilogy. Okay, good. Because that, that will change my review drastically. Because I was under the, the attitude that he was done. Because I cracked open my copy of Thanos the Infinity Siblings. And this is Jim Starlin, Alan Davis. Uh, I was going off... I mean, first to review... This is uh, Jim Starlin and Alan Davis at their best. This is an amazing story. I found myself flipping back and forth on pages because it's told over various time periods. It's all laid out very clear, but you know, I sometimes I get confused. So sometimes I had to go back and see, okay, this takes place in the year 4,000. Wait a minute, this takes place back in the year 2000. Wait a minute, this takes a couple places forward. Just when I thought the story was over, I'm like, oh, I'm only halfway through this graphic novel. And then by the time you get to the end of it, you're like, oh, because I thought this was it for Jim Starlin. And I was like, I will never see how this ends. But if he's going to do the final two, which I'll probably be drooling over like I am now. Uh, oh, gosh, go out and buy this thing. I, I don't even know where to describe it because it's, it's I'll just read off the back cover because that seems to work. You know, Thanos, the Mad Titan, he has everything he ever wanted, but he's not satisfied just not in his vocabulary. When a temporal distortion on Titan draws his attention, he finds the purpose he's been searching for. There's old enemies lurking in the far future, takes the combined wits of Thanos and his brother Eros to stop him. But, oh yeah, they're going to save the multiverse too, but there's other players in this cosmic chess game. And uh, Thanos may find himself outmatched, which doesn't happen a lot. Had this book been it, I would have been frustrated beyond belief because I cannot believe where Starlin and Davis leave Thanos. Uh, fortunately, we're going to have the other two books to find out. In the meantime, though, go out and pick yourself up Thanos Infinity Siblings. It should be available now. And if you haven't, go back and pick up the first trilogy, which I think was the Infinity Finale, the Infinity Revel Relativity, and the Infinity Revelation. And, uh, you know, of course... As I'm reading this book at work, you know, I got a lot of people, oh, you're reading Thanos. Is that about Avengers? And you're like, I don't know what's tougher, trying to explain the history of Thanos or trying to explain why they don't call Captain Marvel Shazam, <laughs> why Miss Marvel is, who she was, why the current Miss Marvel is not Miss Marvel, but it's Captain Marvel, and why they don't call Captain Marvel Captain Marvel Shazam. Well, then what do they call him, Captain Marvel Jr.? I said, I don't know. They might call him Shazam Jr., or maybe it's Mary Shazam with the Lieutenant Shazams and Bunny Shazam and old Uncle Shazam. I really don't know. Uh, it's kind of like when I was at the uh, con and uh, one of our buddies, Pat, was he was going to buy the Infinity War gauntlet because his uh, girlfriend wanted to read it. And I said, no, don't buy the Infinity War. He says, but it, the movie's Infinity War. I said, yes, but this is part two of a saga that has nothing to do with the movies. The closest you're going to get is the Infinity Gauntlet. And I lucked out and found a copy of it. What I should have given him is the uh, Silver, Surfic, Silver Surfer Epic Collection Infinity Gauntlet, which has, I believe, the Infinity Gauntlet miniseries as well as the lead-up to the return of Thanos because, you know, there's that 20-year gap between them. Uh, and then, of course, trying to explain who Adam Warlock is, trying to explain who the Magnus is, trying to explain who <laughs> she was, or the Crusade, and blah, 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 blah. Forget it. Just forget what I said. Go out by yourself, Thanos, the Infinity Siblings. Now! Uh, last book I'm going to be reviewing, because we're up to an hour here, is uh, the I have the, uh, 12, the first of the hardcovers of Star Wars. It has the first 12 issues. And it's got the uh, story that takes place right after Star Wars, and then the infamous story of um, Han Solo's wife that everybody lost their minds about. <laughs> um, the first uh, batch of issues was by John Cassidy, who's probably the best person at drawing... Um, He's probably the best person at drawing um, real people, you know, doing stories where the the characters are based on real people. And you know, Jason Aaron's story is a lot of fun. It feels like Star Wars, 
but John Cassidy's art just made it come to life. It felt like this was a Star Wars movie that I had not seen before. And then the second batch of stories was by Stuart Immerman, who has a more cartoony style, a more uh, art-based style, less realistic, but he really stayed uh, what they call, what do they call it, um, on... Uh, I can't think of the right word where it's okay this the characters look like the characters so uh, oh on on model they look very on model which I was not used to from Stuart Immerman because his characters are more caricature and uh, less less realistic but he really went realistic with the second story as well and both of these stories felt like Star Wars movies that just I, I hadn't seen before. Rather than, oh, this is a Star Wars story that plays around and, you know, you can ignore it or not. Kind of like what the uh, extended universe became. Where it's, okay, well, you know, I can read this or I can ignore it. It doesn't matter. These felt like they, they fit perfectly in there. And uh, probably my favorite batch of comic book Star Wars stories so far. Um, there's a hardcover that does the 12 issues. There's also a uh, Obi-Wan's journal story, which is uh, kind of, okay, here's what Obi-Wan Kenobi was up to during all those years after um, Star Wars 3 and before Star Wars 4, when he was just kind of hanging out on Tatooine, waiting for Luke Skywalker to grow up. And it really felt like world building, where they made Tatooine more interesting. It made it so it wasn't just, you know, oh, Luke Skywalker's just kind of hanging around waiting to be, you know, a grown-up. It showed that there was peril, that there was danger to him, and Obi-Wan was kind of looking over him and making sure that he survived. Um, I really Star Wars heavy reading over the last few weeks. I've even got the Asuka novel that I want to read after I'm caught up on a few other things. But it, it really was satisfying and very well done, and I'm glad I waited for the big 12-issue book because there were a few issues where I would read it, and it's like, oh, here's the cover for another issue. I would have read that comic in four minutes. So on the uh, buy, borrow, ignore, the Star Wars uh, first hardcover is a buy. And I'm reading the second hardcover, and it looks like it's going to be a buy as well. Joe, do you have any more to review? Nope, that's uh, that's pretty much it. Well, you know who doesn't have a review, but instead we've reviewed them and said that they're awesome. Thumbs up. These guys, our sponsors. That's right, here at the Solitaire Rose Radio Network, we have ads, and our first sponsor is me. That's right, your charming and delightful old Uncle Rap Bastard. I have my first book out with Dangerous Dan Moore. It's the first hundred strips of our online web strip, Worldwide News, the story of the lowest rated cable news network. And you can get yourself a copy with commentary, with all sorts of extras, with uh, signatures and everything. Just email Dan over at lordshadowflame at gmail.com. Our top sponsor, who's been with us since day one, is DreamHost. DreamHost.com. You need yourself a website, and DreamHost.com is the number one web host in the whole known universe. Just head over to DreamHost.com, put in the code CRAZY, K-R-A-Y-Z, get $20 off your first year. How can you beat that? Our other sponsor is Graze, G-R-A-Z-E. Dot com Healthy snacks for a healthy lifestyle. Just head over to Gray's, put in the code C-O-R-Y-S-3-R-5-P. Your first and fifth box are free. You can get them weekly. You can get them bi-weekly. You can get them monthly. You just order a whole bunch of them. It's great stuff to keep you away from the vending machine at work. Now, if you would like to leave a comment for any of the podcasts that we do, we'd love those. Go ahead and email us at solitairerosenetwork at gmail.com, or you can call 952-856-0519. Operators are standing by. 
Okay, it's just a place that will record your calls, but we'll play them on the air. We'll answer your questions. We love getting feedback. Tell us what you think. Ask a question. Suggest a topic. Be a guest. Send us your stuff. SolitaireRoseNetwork at gmail.com. If you would like to advertise on any of the Solitaire Rose radio shows, you can. Just email us at SolitaireRoseNetwork at gmail.com. Subject advertising. Thanks. God, what a swell bunch of guys. And you know who else is a swell bunch of guys? And gals. Who's that? These other podcasts that we host on this year network. The Solitaire Rose Radio Network has all sorts of podcasts. We've got Scrabbling Across the West with Dave Caffell and his lovely bride, Stephanie. They travel across the country playing uh, musical gigs, and at night they sit down to play Scrabble and talk about their day at scrabbling.solitairerose.com. There's Novelcast over at novels.solitairerose.com, where I take the novels that I've written and turn them into audio podcasts. Currently, we are doing a novel called Do the Job, which is a murder mystery set in the world of 1980s professional wrestling. Then over at badadvice.solitairerose.com, me, Corey Strode, and Wolfie B. Bad, along with Dan Moore, give bad advice to people who send in questions. That's bad advice over at badadvice.solitairerose.com. The Solitaire Rose Radio Network is growing. Be there! You think NBC will get mad I used that? And now we get to Joe's favorite part of the episode. No, no, no. I can finally take a drink of this stout I've been sitting with. Ah, that hits the spot. No, not where I give Joe a bunch of Wookiee Band-Aids. It's, uh, what's going on on the Ebays, Joe? Well, everything's back. Uh, I'm working through the graphic novels, you know, trying to figure out which ones didn't sell at the con at the charity booth and the ones that didn't put back. Uh, just take a quick look at some of the last couple of things I've sold. Cap, Corey, have you ever heard of Captain Easy? Yes. Yep. It's a uh, uh, created by Roy Crane. Uh, I believe he, Roy did a, a comedy newspaper strip, 1924. He, he was a uh, creator of Wash Tubbs character. And after five years, he created Captain Easy as kind of an adventuring counterpoint to Tubbs. In 33, Captain Easy got his own strip. The strips were taken over by Les Turner. And uh, Easy was one of the many comic strip characters that had a run in comic books. I had a very poor copy of Captain Easy number 16, which dates from 1949. Near wow. Mint goes close to 100 bucks. Uh, for a while there, I was interested in collecting Captain comics. And what it was is way back in my D&D days, I had this. The, everybody heard about the festival. And what it was, it was a cross-dimensional, cross-multi-domain dom, thing where people once, twice if they were lucky, would find themselves. And there any fictional character you would find. And so as you're walking, here's a tent with all the doctors in there. And again, rattle off every doctor, Dr. Doom, Dr. Doodle, Dr. Uh, McCoy. Uh, anyways, there was a captain tent. And I tried to get as many captain comics as I could. I wanted number ones, but there was no way I was going to get a Captain America number one. So I just had all these things. So then when somebody... Well, I want to go in here. Okay, here are the guys you run into. Here's Captain Easy. Here's Captain Kangaroo. Here's uh, Captain Crunch, Captain America, Captain Britain, blah, blah, blah. So it was just one of those weird books that I picked up somewhere in time. I just sold it on the Ebays. Corey should know the answer to this. Corey, what's significant? Oh, sorry, I'm saying it wrong. It's been so long. Corey, it is time for this shiny dime. Dime. Dime, that's a quarter, nickel, dollar. Here, there we go, got one. What is significant about Batman 368? That's the first Tim Drake. Ah, uh, nope. A little, little earlier. Oh, then it was uh, Jason Todd. And, and it's the first one of him as Robin at his first appearance. And uh, I, kudos to an eBay person who, you know, caught my dyslexia because I had it listed as Batman 386. And he said, you know, it'll probably sell better if you if you put the right number in there. And by gosh, it did almost right away. 
So mine was only a fine copy, went for 20 but if you have one, it, it goes a lot more in mint. Another piece of my Shazam collection is gone, Shazam number 24 from uh, 1976. Uh, and I, I, I had something interesting that was given to comic shops back in the year 2000 when CrossGen was coming out. They sent me... The year 2000. They actually sent me the first issues of... Um, how do you say it? Okay, Meridian, Sigil... Sigil. Sigil. And Scion. So I actually had copies of the first issue. It said number one review copies. And on the bottom, it was in big letters, white banner, customer preview review copy, diamond reorder, the number, call diamond, not for sale until June 21st uh, for Scion, for Meridian, June 28th, and Sigil would be June 14th. Uh, Somehow I still have these books, so I put them together as a package. Uh, there's people still interested in cross-gen. Hell, I'm still interested in Ultraverse. And the only way you would get these is had if the comic shop that had them kept them. And I just put them together as a bundle, ended up selling it. Uh, last book I'll talk about, just because it's so utterly friggin' ridiculous. Corey, let's go back to 1976. Amazing Spider-Man 158. On the cover, we have... A uh, very angry Dr. Octopus choking out Spider-Man while behind him in utter peril is Aunt May. And who do you think is frightening poor Aunt May? Why, that's the ghost of Hammerhead. Oh, and he's going to murder Aunt May. This was just a weird run because for some reason Hammerhead was dead and he was trying to spook Dr. Octopus into making some thingamajig that would restore his incorporeal form back into corporal energy. And Dr. Octopus was utterly terrified of him. And I was like, wow, this ain't the octopus. We knew, you know, well, that uh, switched bodies and became superior. This is um, Dr. Octopus and Hammerhead got uh, blowed up real good in an atomic bomb. He got nuked. And, and that was after he married Aunt May. I don't know. Or was it? did that marriage not go it through? It did not go through. Oh, so in other words, that happens a lot to the Parkers. One more day, no Dr. Octopus. <sighs> but the uh, way Dr. Octopus survived was he wrapped himself in his arms because if you remember his origin... Tentacle porn! His arms were used for uh, manipulating radioactive material. So they were able to protect him from being ground zero at a nuclear bomb. Boom. And uh, in the stories hey, leading up to this... Films did it in a, in a, in a refrigerator, so it, there, it could have happened. In the stories leading up to this, Dr. Octopus was a homeless bum. That stinking bum. <laughs> and then we saw the ghost of Hammerhead. And uh, Joe, this three-part story was reprinted recently oh. in Marvel Comics Digest number one featuring Spider-Man. <sighs> there it is right there on a clear DA. You can see the Mirage. Uh, let's see, what's the next part of the story called? Um, the Ghost That Haunted Octopus. <laughs> the uh, next part of the story, the one that you're talking about, Hammerhead is out. And then the conclusion, arm in arm in arm in arm in arm in arm in arm with Dr. Octopus. You gotta love the word balloon. <laughs> Says so Spider Man's being choked. I got to break free of Dr. Octopus before the ghost of Hammerhead murders my Aunt May. <laughs> <sighs> oh, 70s. But it was still only 25 cents. Yep. And you can still go on my eBay page and see all the fun stuff I've got. By the time this here podcast drops, I'll put up all the fun things I found at the con. K R A Y Z. Either go to the Quarry's website and, and uh, link to it or just follow me on the ebays itself if you're uh if you do make a bid for it either the paper girl collection or uh, uh you, you can't talk about any things i i just uh talked about because they're already sold but uh just send me a quick note either through my email or through ebay's uh, message center or on your paypal payment or whatever that you listen to this here podcast and i'll i'll include something well, let's just see if I reached out. I would grab a copy of, hey, look at this. Here's the Genesis edition of Dawn from Wizard. That's what I think this was. Uh, 
I don't know if this was a mail away or, or what it was. But it was during service, so it's got some real funky uh, Joe Linsner art on it. Or, or over here, I reach this way and grab a uh, a set of AMC The Walking Dead soap on a rope Daryl Walker ear necklace. Man, you cannot shower without a Daryl Walker ear necklace. So if you were, if you, were, if you got loot crate, you would have got it. Well, I got one, and and if I don't shower, which I probably won't, it probably just go on eBay. <sighs> And now we get to my favorite part of the show. No, 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 not where we do a breakdown of the album Spider-Man Rock Reflections of a Superhero. Although we could. It's freaking a geeking. Joe, what are you freaking on? Well, I, I talked about, you know, how the, I had a rheumatoid flare-up last week. It's kind of flared down, but uh, I think I'm going to have to go give me some uh, chiropractic love because... Uh, you, you figure, let's see, one week I was standing on a concrete floor for uh, two days, and then I went up north and hiked a bunch of trails, and I come back, I'm back at work, and I just, you know, my neck is stiff. I mean, you're talking, I can't, I can't turn it, and I have a, the damnedest time standing on one of my legs. It's like the sciatic has just lit the leg up all the way down to my ankle, and it's just no stretching or any type of... Uh, Icing, well, icing helps, but, uh, you know, I've been taking ibuprofen, so I, I haven't gone to the chiropractic. Icing. I know. I haven't been, chocolate's the best. I haven't been to a chiropractor in a while, so it, it'll, uh, hopefully that helps, and next week it'll be back in the geeking category. Uh, my uh, cable box kind of died on me. We got two ones, a DVR. And the other one's just a, a receiver box. And I went in and turned it on so I could take my news nap. My daughter got her uh, herself an Xbox, which we use not only to watch Netflix, to, but to play DVDs and Blu-ray on. And uh, so she had the, the uh, living room and was playing Xbox, which, you know, I've, I've never had a video game beyond the Wii. And it's kind of weird watching it because, I mean, yeah, Goat's, you know, simulator is kind of weird but some of those other games it's almost like watching a movie the graphics are so crazy uh so if, consequently if you got any xbox games i think the x it's a 360 i don't is it what came first the 360 or the one the 360 and the one and if you're feeding if you're watching blu-rays it's a one it's an xbox one okay so if you got any recommendations uh you know Given to me, I'd, I'd be curious to, you know, I don't spend a lot of time on video games, but I could. Doom. Doom. I, I actually. Doom. I was looking for Duke Nukem first. You now, got is it Duke Nukem. I, I'd never played it. I'd like to play it on different formats. I did see where I could download the classic one and, and play it again if I want, which I may do because the version I got does not play well with Windows 10. <laughs> Probably an old DOS version. Uh. And other than that, I wish I still was on vacation. <sighs> Don't we all? Corey, what are you freaking on? Uh, we, we talked a little earlier about you asked if I'd seen uh, Deadpool. Yes. I haven't seen Deadpool. Haven't seen Solo. Uh -huh. It's just uh -huh. been too busy. Just been too damn busy. Um, I, I, you know, don't even want to go into it too deep. But, man, it's, and, you know, how Facebook has the on this day. But mm -hmm. the last two years, for some reason, May gets insanely busy. May into June gets insanely busy. So I guess I should just get used to it. But I'm not. And uh, this coming weekend, they were twisting my arm to work again for over 40 hours. And it's like, no, I'm burning out. I'm sleeping there every night, pretty much all month. I'm burning out. I need some time home. I need to do my own laundry and my own dishes. That way I can hate myself. And uh, mad editor and gag writer Nick Meglin passed away over the weekend. Um, Nick was a... He worked at Mad forever, but he was the editor from 84... Well, the mid-80s to 2004. And he was one of those guys who was at Mad forever. A lot of people got their start with him working on his you know, working with him so that he could punch up their work um so you if you go out on the internet you'll read some really touching tributes by sam vivano and um 
uh, Mark Evanier and the uh, new editor, Bill Morrison. Um, it sounds like he was just a, he was a complicated guy in that he was funny and he was that right mix of uh, clever and stupid that worked for mad. Um, he could fly off the handle in a heartbeat, but he'd give you the shirt off his back. Um, really mad in the, you know, 60s, 70s, into the 80s when Bill Gaines was in charge. The people there were intensely talented, but also kind of, you know, they couldn't work anywhere else. And he sounds like he was one of those guys who, in Mad's world, he was perfect, but outside of it, he probably would not have been able to keep a job. So a lot of the old, uh, a lot of the old guard at Mad are passing away. I'm kind of shocked that Al Jaffe's still alive. He's going to be what? He's in his nineties and still doing the fold ins. So, uh, <sighs> Joe, what are you geeking on? I got another uh, freaking here that's just happening as we talk. So I, I posted a video about a 9-11 call in Canada about escaped elephants. And it's like, yeah, yeah, there's an elephant outstanding right now. And the cops, there are no outstanding elephants. And uh, I mean, really, elephant escaped. And the 911 operator was crazy. Facebook tagged it as inappropriate. So apparently elephants in Facebook's world are inappropriate well you, you've seen their you've, you've seen their noses i think the noses ain't that what i'm worried about what what's the elephant doing now uh, he seems to be eating a tree <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, anyways but on to the on to the geeking uh toys r us has dropped everything again it's 40 percent off uh, i went back unfortunately being gone for three weeks i did not get the rick flair robe i was looking at a couple weeks ago, I sh you know I didn't Woo! want to buy it at like thirty percent off, but I thought at forty percent it might be kind of fun. And of course, if you're in the Twin Cities and you have that Ric Flair robe, I will hunt you down and I will find you. I have a particular skill set that is non-threatening in any way. But, anyways, what was I saying? Anyways, uh, it looks like the final day. Uh, there was a sign posted at one of the stores I visited. Maybe. Uh, June 27th. So if you're in the metro area, Twin Cities, uh, Minnesota, and you want to hit the TRUs, that's it. I know the one out in Minnetonka was actually closed before they decided just to close them all. So it might actually be gone. So, and again, there's, you know, there's still some stuff there, but, you know, I mean, things are getting picked through. There's things I've gone back to look for and, uh, you know, they've been picked up. But, uh, you know, like any carcass, there's always something else you can pick through. So check it out. I talked about it last week, uh, and I finished it up almost, I don't know, at an alarming pace. Uh, I read the book Gunflint Burning, Fire in the Boundary Waters by Carrie J. Griffin. Uh, this talks about the area I was vacationing in last week up in the Boundary Waters and a, a tremendous fire that hit in 2007. Uh, scars of which you can still see if you find yourself up in northern Minnesota doing the Gunflint Trail. Uh, it's just uh, a very comprehensive account. Things moved fast. It's amazing just how the firefighters work. Uh, sadly, there was there was only one casualty. The gentleman they they uh, figured started the fire by accident uh, committed suicide when he realized. Uh, well, nobody really knows why. He just, you know, was aghast at what had happened. And, you know, when the courts decided to make an example of him, they kind of came down uh, kind of heavy on him, which, you know, even some of the residents up there, they're like, yeah, it, it happened, but that, you know, there was no burning ban. It uh, could have happened to almost anyone that was up there. And uh, it was something I was worried on because the conditions were the same even as we were up there, but they just recently got a oodle, oodles of rain, a plethora of water from heaven. So hopefully that eases up the fire damage. Uh, but if you ever want to just read just how hard some of these fire jumpers work, uh, this would be the book to pick up. At the con, I picked up a book called Spider-Man Return of the Burglar, which covers Amazing Spider-Man 193 to 200 
which if you recall, I've said numerous times, I started reading at 178. And so this actually was a large chunk of uh, Spider-Man. It, it starts after, uh, you know, Spider-Man's worried that uh, uh, J. Jonah Jameson removed his masks when they were shackled together, trying to avoid the, uh, the fly. And, uh, you know, it's kind of weird again. You go back and, you know, th this was Spider-Man on a small level. You know, fighting the fly almost seems like going backwards. Uh, first appearance of the Black Cat. Uh, the, the issue that blew my mind, I think, uh, where she allegedly dies, uh, Parker pisses off all her friends, finds out Aunt May dies, and then Chris finds out, of course, that's a ruse. Uh, awesome fight between him and Kingpin. Jabe Jonah Jason has a, has a uh, breakdown, and then, of course, it leads to the return of the burglar, who apparently had returned before... The issue I started, 178, but never was picked up again until later. So just kind of a fun rundown memory lane. Mar Marv Wolfman was writing it. Keith Pollard was drawing it. Al Milgram. Uh, was it, it had to be Sal Buscema, right? I don't think. Uh, yeah. Sal Buscema yeah, could, did some inks and some work on a uh, fill-in yeah. issue, I believe. So it was kind of fun, and plus I don't have those issues anymore. This will, I, I probably have them in essential format downstairs. I, like I said, I'm still trying to put that run together. Uh, box Day is coming up in two days. So uh, what do you think, Corey? Next week we you, you'll do your opening Box Day video, and we'll, we'll talk a little about Box Day. Okay, that sounds good. We can also talk about what's in previews. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, that, I, I probably will go for that more than anything else. And it's going to be a rainy day on Wednesday, so I may just be in reading comic books all day. I got to work. Yeah, but when you get home, you'll have a box. Actually, I will have my box tomorrow on Tuesday. So if anybody wants to meet me at the Super American Chaska, we'll go intercept Corey's box and open it before him. You can't take anything. You can't touch anything. But we'll open it. Will they clean my house? Only if they hate you. No, no, no. I have to hate them. You make up your own rules. I'll make up mine. I clean my own house. I am a self-loathing person. Well, that, that's true. Finally, I want to congratulate my daughter, Holly. She just graduated high school and got herself a diploma. She's been going to college classes these last two years and elected not to go to her high school graduation ceremony uh, just because she hasn't been there in two years. She doesn't really connect with it anymore. And she's, she just announced to me, I'm going to get my diploma. And I'm like, what do you mean? Yeah, I'm thinking college. And she's like, no, no, I'm a high school diploma because it's all done. I said, they have it ready for you? I said, yeah, today's uh, graduation day. But since I'm not in it, uh, I think I can just go pick it up. And I said, well, I hope so. All I remember on my graduation is I got a, a, a instead of the actual diploma, I got a note saying, well, once we've cleared your financial records, i.e. you paid for everything, and you've <laughs> passed all your classes, because they let the seniors go like two, three weeks before school was out. So we took our finals, and then, of course, the teachers had to finish the grades. So basically, you take your final Friday, graduate Saturday, and then you're off school for three weeks. Uh, so that's what I got. And I, I'm not... I think I have my diploma, but for the most part, I just left my note in my little folder that they gave you, you know. So kudos to Holly. Uh, I, I, I think she knows where she's going this fall. And uh, I hope, you know, like Dana ahead of her, she has a, a fun journey and uh, keeps reading comics. Corey, what, the, what you geeking on? What's got you happier than a clam and uh, escaping a clam bake? Uh, well, the first thing I am geeking on... Um, one of the things about sleeping at the group home is because I, uh, my alarm goes off and I don't have the, the luxury of hitting the snooze alarm, which we've talked about in the past, I remember my dreams a little better. And I had a dream last week that is going to be an awesome short story. In this dream, I was in a shopping mall that you couldn't get out of where they were testing new products on us. And when I asked, you know, why am I trapped here? Why aren't I allowed to leave? Why aren't I, you know, able to talk to anybody? And they say, well, you know, that new cell phone you have? Yeah, you should have read the terms and conditions. Joe's not listening at all. <laughs> I'm listening. 
just, it just like hit me like a brick. <laughs> and this is in a dream where it does. Yeah, you should have read the terms and conditions. Oh man. <laughs> oh man. Um, over the weekend, Pro Wrestling Tees had a sale. Uh, it was uh, buy five items, get twenty five percent off. Well, Pro Wrestling Tees has uh, all of the uh, New Japan shirts, Ring of Honor shirts, a lot of wrestlers who you know aren't in wrestling anymore, like CM Punk, Bobby Heenan. Yeah, I loaded up. <laughs> I have three new cleaner shirts, a New Japan shirt, and a CM Punk hoodie. You thought Simon Cowell had an impressive T-shirt collection? Yeah, well, I don't wear them as tight as him because you know I, I'm not that desperate for attention. I just, uh, anytime there's a new cleaner shirt, I want it. <laughs> I have eight of them now. <laughs> uh, Comic-wise, Comixology and Amazon have announced that they are getting into publishing. They've uh, picked up a few books. Uh, they're starting a few books. And uh, the fact that it's Amazon behind this, you can either um, purchase them on Comixology. You can get them if you get that Comixology Unlimited, which I haven't gotten yet, to binge read them. Or they will do print on demand. So uh, th these companies would not get into making comics and they wouldn't have signed the creators are signing if they weren't serious about uh, jumping into that field and uh, any new publisher that's got big money behind them is good in my mind because that means that there's going to be more comics out there um, you know if Amazon's going to be putting some money behind it they're not going to just let it sit there they're going to do some marketing so I'm excited about that and the last thing I am geeking on is a graphic novel that will be coming out next year Joe did you know that Salvador Dali once wrote a screenplay for the Marx Brothers? I do now. He did, and they're turning it into a graphic novel. Oh, sweet. <laughs> and all I could think is, it's such a damn shame that Dave Sim can't draw anymore. Because I still think High Society, you know, the, the Cerebus book, is the best Marx Brothers movie that the Marx Brothers weren't in. The way he drew Groucho and Chico and Harpo was spot on wonderful, and he was a, he captured their personalities, he captured their sense of humor, um, like no other people have ever before. And the fact that he's not able to draw means he's not going to be drawing this. But a new Marx Brothers graphic novel based on a screenplay written by Salvador Dali. That. Tops weirdness for one week and makes me happy. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there you go, kids. That's what I'm geeking on. Believe it or not, you've listened. To whoa, 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 whoa! I, I don't know if you dropped it during our, uh, uh, you know, the thing you dropped that I, I have to listen to after next week because you don't tell me what's in it. But you didn't mention that you started up worldwide news as of the. The uh, third of June. Oh, that's right. A web strip you do with Dangerous Daniel Moore. Is, do I have to keep on top of you for this? I mean, it's a new story and it's freaking funny. Yeah, you have to keep on top of me because it, uh, it showed up and Dan didn't even tell me he was doing it. Oh, where is that guy? I, I got a hotline to Wolfie. He'll, Dan's going to find something uh, in his sock tomorrow he's not going to be pleased with. So head on over to WorldWideNews.SolitaireRose.com. A new story started, and uh, you might read it and think, oh, this is based on current events. Nope, it was written almost a year ago. That's it. <laughs> Sandwich and soup. Oh, That's it, Corey. It won't be tolerated here. Well, believe it or not, kids. You have listened to us blather on about funny books for an hour and a half. Thank you. And as we say every week, the comic we like the least, we still like better than the comic that you uh, like the most. Joe? It's people like you that give people like you a bad name. Jessica Jones on Jessica Jones. Hit my music. <laughs>